Welcome everyone. We're gonna get going. I'd like you to I'd like to welcome you to part two of our four part series on designing for touch. It's part of our user experience track for the New York Technology Council. We're a nonprofit industry association here in the New York, Greater New York area. Uh, first I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, it sounds trite, but if it weren't for them we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, Frankfurt Kernick, who's giving us the space tonight, is uh, one of our sponsors. And, uh, and with that, let me uh, introduce Charles Morrow, who uh, organizes this user experience track. And uh, Charles. Thanks, Eric. Uh, OK. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, this is the second uh, in our mobile series. And uh, uh, just a couple of points uh, before we start off. Uh, we, we're looking for a larger home. And if any of you uh, work for large corporations or have uh, contacts with uh, uh, venues uh, that uh, work with nonprofits, it would be great to uh, hear from you and contact us uh, through uh, email. That would probably be the best bet. Uh, our, our, as uh, Eric said, our last two uh, sessions are now up. Uh, Paul Thurman's session, the two ago, and then the session with Jason Farman uh, from uh, last time. Both of those went up this afternoon. We will send you the links uh, to both of these sessions uh, with our uh, follow-up survey, which you'll get tomorrow morning around 9 o'clock. Um, incidentally, we, we read all of the, uh, the feedback, all of the surveys, and uh, we take all of that uh, response very seriously. Um, okay. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, of course, uh, we set this up a couple of months ago, and uh, we uh, have a, a substantial following there. Like everyone else, we have Facebook as well. Um, just a couple of the events that are coming up only in the UX track. Uh, coming up, uh, part three, uh, opportunities in mobile um, in complex business models. Uh, Mr. Reese from Google, who showed show up last time, is coming back. Uh, we've roped him in. And David Fine from uh, Time uh, Warner will also be here. Uh, both uh, great speakers, and it should be a very interesting program. And then part four, we have uh, specialists in simulation UX design tools. And uh, we've identified a couple of speakers there, but haven't announced them yet. OK, so for tonight's speaker, uh, Josh Clark. Uh, he's designer, a designer that specializes in mobile strategy and user experience. Uh, Josh's uh, business, uh, Global Moxie, um, is a highly regarded consulting firm here in the city and has done some very innovative work. Uh, in the category of uh, mobile and responsive sites. Uh, he's the author of three books, uh, most specifically uh, Tapworthy, uh, just published recently, I guess, is now in four other languages or something like that. Um, and uh, he worked as a, a management consultant for Monitor. I don't know if any of you know, uh, know Monitor, but it's uh, you know, a very large firm, sort of on the level of McKinsey. And he created uh, a number of years ago uh, a relatively famous program called Couch to 5K, which uh, was responsible for uh, bringing a significant number of people uh, to formal exercise. Uh, more interesting, I think, is uh, the fact that he was a producer for PBS, um, at WGBH in Boston, and he interviewed, among others, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Gorbachev, and Nancy Reagan, but I hope not necessarily in that order. And uh, he's a graduate of uh, Harvard. So uh, Josh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let me sling you guys some of my slides here. So um, yeah, this is a, obviously this has been a, a mobile UX track. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of the, the series. Um, my principal sort of area of practice uh, is both in terms of strategy of how do you use all these different devices, but in particular, a particular favorite topic of mine is just to think about what are the new interactions that these devices propose. Uh, and today, of course, I'm talking about touch. Um, I'm super excited about the possibilities of touch interfaces that we've already begun to see, but also still the things that we've yet to really properly explore as a, as a UX practice. And uh, I believe that, that touch forces, or should force, really fundamental differences, really fundamental changes in the way that we approach user interfaces, both as, as consumers, as people who use these things, but also, and, and, and really more importantly, perhaps, as designers. Because I think that touch is going to help us to sweep away decades of 
buttons and menus and folders and all this administrative debris mm -hmm. that we've accumulated over the last three decades of uh, the graphic user interface. Because when you get rid of this thing, you know, the cursor and the mouse, these prosthetics that we've been using to point at stuff for the last 30 years, uh, all that remains uh, is you and the device, or better yet, you and the content. That's the illusion that we have the opportunity to create. You know, you know all user interfaces are illusion, right? Just this thin layer of magic that we stretch out over the, this churn of ones and zeros to try to make what's happening understandable. And the exciting thing about uh, uh, touch is that we can create this illusion of direct interaction, the illusion that there is no illusion, right? which is sort of an, an exciting shift. Um, it cuts through complexity to give the impression that you're working directly with the content, manipulating information as if it were a physical object. Uh, because you know buttons and, and, and controls and all the things that we've been using in graphic user interfaces do add complexity. It's a layer of abstraction, of visual processing that we have to do to understand how to work the thing. Uh, and you know, it's a problem that we always confront as designers. The more features that we want to put into software, the more controls that we need, right? So you get this clutter of toolbars and, and visual complexity. And one of the great things about touch and gesture is that you can add features without adding that visual complexity. That comes with trade-offs, right? Of how do you understand that, that feature the features and functionality that aren't visually advertised. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think one important piece is that some of those traditional controls just don't work as well when you put them into a touch interface. And it's particularly true, I think, as the touch interfaces get larger. So if you consider the iPad, for, for example, uh, say I'm looking at uh, email on my iPad, and I get this email from ThinkGeek. And by the way, if you're not doing all of your shopping at thinkgeek.com, I think you're probably not hooked up right. I'm just saying. You should check it out. <laughs> so I get this email, right? But I want to go back to my sent messages. And the iPad mail app, like so many iPad apps, uses this so-called UI split view to have this back button that reveals you know, the, 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 the sort of the sibling content at the same level of information. So I reach up, and I pack at this little button, and I'm tapping at all these little tiny controls in specific areas. So this big, expansive touch screen, but my interaction is just limited to this little, tiny area. I'm probably more sensitive to this than most people, but friends, I want to share something with you, and that is, I hate that thing. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Hates the back button, but loves keynote transitions. I'm just saying. <laughs> Wait, we'll see that one again. Uh, Fitz Law comes into play here. Many of you are probably familiar with Fitz Law, but quickly, it's, it's this, this principle that emerged out of studies that were done in the middle of the last century to sort of measure how long it takes to move a physical object with some kind of a pointer. Think about a puck and a shuffleboard stick to move it to a target. The emerging principle is pretty obvious, not surprising. You know, the smaller the target and the further away it is, the harder it is to hit. It's what makes golf such a miserable sport. <laughs> it's law. This came to be in the 80s applied to visual interfaces. And, and so it sort of began to inform uh, where you should put uh, mouse targets and buttons and how large they should be and, and what proximity they should have. And again, it's just the idea is that the further away it is and the smaller it is, the harder it is to hit, the more concentration it takes. Turns out it works for touch screens too. Even though it's not a pointer, uh, like a mouse or like a shuffleboard puck, but your actual finger, it maps pretty well. The mathematics of how hard it is to hit targets maps pretty well, especially as these screens get larger. Because if you think about iOS, if you have these same buttons, same size buttons on the phone versus the iPad, easy to hit on the phone, just a sweep of your thumb. But on the iPad, you're lifting this whole meat pointer up and over into this sort of top corner. And it takes actual physical effort, let alone the concentration to actually hit these things. You know, our sort of guiding principle as designers ought to be this. Let me be as lazy as I can, right? Don't make me work for it. Certainly don't actually require physical effort to do something. That's something to understand is that when you're dealing with these physical devices, there's now physical ergonomics to consider here. You know, and so sort of you don't want to make me work too hard just to sort of push at those buttons. And do you even need buttons at all? Or can you at least provide an alternative? 
So iOS, for example, to return here, back in iOS 5, instead of making me hit that inbox button, they introduced this. I can just sort of swipe out from anywhere on the screen and then swipe it back in. So I can just be resting my hands here at the side and just give it a quick flip. No arm motion required. And I'm starting to use the entire screen as a control, right? A coarse gesture instead of fine-tuned pecking. And that's sort of the, the opportunity that this introduces. What else might we do? Well, one thing that you could do that they don't do, we could start to think about things like, well, a five-finger touch could take me directly to my sent mail. But there are problems with this, right? One is discoverability. How am I supposed to know that a five-finger touch will do anything? Because if you don't advertise it, it's just an Easter egg, right? You discover it by accident, or someone tells you about it. It's a surprise. Another thing is accessibility. Not everybody has five fingers, right? I was in New Orleans a few months ago. My cab driver had a hook. He's like, wow, welcome to New Orleans. <laughs> Obviously, this guy's going to have trouble with any touchscreen interface, right? Uh, but, there are, but even for sort of less severe disabilities, just for simple things of mobility, not everyone's going to have the dexterity uh, or the ability to use more complex gestures like this. So it can't be the only way to do things. I think especially when you think about these sort of shortcuts for doing things and moving through uh, uh, your application, your interface sort of quickly, you should really think about these as the keyboard shortcuts of touch. You know, that, that these are things that are often sort of understood to be advanced features, but not the only way to do things. What makes them shortcuts? It's this time-saving aspect uh, that you can just slap at the whole screen instead of concentrating and fine-tuned pecking at this. Slapping at the screen instead of sort of fine-tuned control. We'll talk a little bit about this. Reader, uh, it's an iPad app to read Google Reader, at least for the next month or whatever it is while we still have Google Reader. Uh, and so here I am, I'm looking at, at my, one of my news feeds. There's an article that I'm reading. Here's some unread articles in this in this feed that I have. And if I want to go back to the group of feeds that I've accumulated here, I've got a back button. It's there, it's visible. But also I've got a gesture possibility here, which is that I can just pinch at this thing, and it closes that out and takes me to this group. I can pinch again, and it shows my list of groups. And this is a sort of an emerging uh, pattern that we're seeing uh, called semantic zoom. We're used to the, seeing zooming in and out on, in sort of a very physical metaphor, right? Maps and photos. We're starting to see it emerge as more of a semantic metaphor of zooming in and out of information levels, right? expanding, exploding a group or collapsing a group to go to the group above it. But one of the things that sort of putting that sort of metaphorical notion aside, what this means is that I can just be sitting here and I can pinch anywhere on the screen, in the corner, wherever my hands are convenient. I don't have to reach up and hit that button. So again, there's this ergonomic convenience to this as well as uh, a somewhat uh, elegant uh, uh, meta navigation metaphor. Again, there's a, there's a discoverability issue, and we'll get, we'll get to that sort of toward the end. How do you manage that stuff? And still there's a back button here. But, you know, do you even need that? Twitter, before they wrecked their iPad app and put in something completely lame, had this app for their, for their iPad thing. And what's interesting about this is they specifically tried to kill the back button, and I think it's good success. What Twitter does, at least sort of what, what this version of the app did, was really encourage you to explore very deeply through the little rabbit hole of one single tweet, right? So you could tap on a tweet, and that would show you the tweet and the URL there. Tap on the avatar, get the profile, tap, see more tweets there. Tap another, and so on. Then to sort of go back, you just swipe back, right? So sort of, you know, in, in two things are happening here. One thing that's very important is that when you're designing a touch interface, you want to give physicality to your information objects. Right? So in this case, it's saying, well, let's take every slice of your history of Twitter and give it physicality. Let's make it a card. The card, the page, very sort of basic uh, metaphor of all touch screen interfaces. But of course, even from the web, you know, we've got this very page interface. And of course, you know, if you've got a browser, well, you've got to have a back button, right? But when you think about the basic metaphor, of flipping through pages. When was the last time you turned a page in the real world using a back button? Breaks the metaphor, right? Sort of, it, it, it puts this layer of abstraction in, into that really basic physical metaphor. And here it's just the cards, just like, we'll just swipe through the cards to get back through them. And again, uh, you're using these very broad 
gestures, just a slap at the entire screen, rather than pecking away at one button. Which is just sort of a big thing that I want to mention here, is that especially as these screens get larger, you guys now are shipping 18 or 20 inch tablets. I don't know, there's like at least five people who bought one probably, but you know, they've got these things now. They're getting bigger. At least, you know. As we're doing that, you want to think about how can I manipulate these with coarse gestures instead of, again, sort of tapping at buttons. Talking about this, though, in, in a, with a real sort of issue of physical comfort, of ergonomics, and that's important, as I, as I hope I've made clear, but there's also a more fundamental conceptual issue here, which is that buttons are a hack. I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. I mean, I think that buttons are an inspired hack, both in the virtual world that many of us work in, but also in the physical world. You know, a light switch over here to turn on a light over here is not intuitive. That has to be learned. Every time I check into a hotel, it takes me like 15 minutes to figure out how to turn that light on in the corner, right? It's a whole different thing. I know there's a light switch. I understand the basic thing, but I have to figure out the connection myself. But wow, it's a lot better than making me go into a dark room with a ladder and screw in the light bulb directly, right? So it's this inspired hack that we came up with 100 years ago to affect primary objects from a distance that we otherwise couldn't. And that's why we came up with all of these controls for the desktop, too. It was a convenient metaphor to try to express what was happening underneath. You know, that we, we put in this necessary layer of abstraction. But understand that it is a layer of abstraction. It's a workaround. It's a hack. It was brilliant because we needed some way to get around it. But when we have touch, we have the opportunity again to create this illusion that we're working on this direct object itself, the information. That we can create that physicality that we may not need buttons to do it. So my point here is not that buttons are bad or evil, but understand that they're a workaround. And in some cases, you may not need that workaround anymore. It may be worth thinking again about, well, how, how should I rethink these settled patterns that I know from the desktop, from mouse and keyboard, to think about them for mouse? So let's look at some of those ways that you can kind of think differently about things. Windows 8 sort of has this religion. Uh, it's a touch-based OS, as I'm sure you all know, designed from the bottom up and for touch first. They haven't cracked the code yet, I would say, for sort of great UX for a desktop operating system that's based on touch. But a lot of great ideas, and they're doing some necessary work to figure out how should this work. It's going to take some time to get it right, as I think their first version sort of shows. Uh, it's not a complete success, I would say, by any means. But while they haven't quite cracked it, they do show a lot of innovative thinking about, well, how do we have to think differently to make this work? Login, for example. Login, we know how to do that. Username and password, works great, right? It's terrible. You know, at Yahoo, 10% of their login attempts end in request for password. 10%, right? So as a result, since you can't ever remember your password, we do, you know, the most popular password, one, two, three, four, five. Number two, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, <laughs> right? Password, I think, is number three. So we have these really insecure <laughs> passwords, or, we can, or, or they're so secure we, could, we can't even log in. Broken system, right? So uh, you've probably seen this in some ads, ads or maybe you've tried it yourself in, in Windows 8. So they have this alternative. It's like, wow, we've got a touch operating system. Well, how can, that, how can we think differently now about that for doing login? And they just let you choose a picture that has some personal meaning to yourself, and you choose a pattern to go on there. So your login might be to circle dad, connect your sisters, punch mom in the face, and boom, <laughs> you're logged in. You know, it turns out this is orders of magnitude more secure from a brute force security perspective than username and password, and it's more personally memorable too. How can sort of direct interaction allow you to think differently about what you would, might consider to be sort of a settled problem. Another example, I think it's kind of interesting. Adobe Proto, it's for folks like us, at least for information architects, people who want to make wireframes. Uh, and what they do here is they, they use basically gestures to let you sketch out your wireframes using all of the established notation, familiar patterns of working on paper to do this. And so if I want to draw a little heading here, there you go. Maybe a little menu bar underneath. Great. I'd probably use a, maybe a video over here. And maybe an image. To a couple of columns of text underneath. 
boom, tap a button, export it as HTML5, you're done. Right? Now look, I don't know, is this, is this better than doing it on Visio or OmniGraffle on the desktop using all that sort of traditional buttons and controls and information panels? I don't know. This is definitely the right way to do it on a touch screen though, right? Whereas otherwise, you know, you're opening all these panels and trying to sort of <laughs> keep it all straight. Not at all tuned for these fat fingers. But doing this, sort of lifting these patterns that are so familiar from the paper world and putting them directly onto the iPad, or, or in this case, it also runs on Android. It's a great, interesting model to do it. So that takes a familiar physical model, sketching, and applies it kind of as is to this new digital format. I think something, though, that's particularly interesting, though, is, is when you start to say, well, what about more native digital objects? And so we're not sort of going to try to pretend that this is paper. Now we're going to say, all right, well, how do you manipulate digital objects as if they were physical? Many of you are probably familiar with uh, Clear, a to-do app that came out for iOS gosh, almost about a year ago now. Let's take a look at well, how it works. I want to point out first that Clear is a crummy to-do list app, right? Unless you're like 12 years old and you have like three things to do all week, there's no way it's going to like manage <laughs> everything you can do in your But as sort of a prototype of how to manipulate a list with touch, it's sort of like here are the fundamental building blocks of a list, a list item and, and several lists and, and ways that you can kind of zoom in and out of, of groups of lists. It's a great example of that. You know, how do you insert a list item? Just make room for it. How do you cross one out? Or just cross it out. You know, and, and part of the thing, too, that I think is, is interesting about this is no buttons, except for on the keyboard, which you guys is a great place for buttons. You know, let's keep buttons on the keyboard. We haven't sort of cracked that one yet, either, except for speech, which is something that I'll talk about in a little bit, too. Um, but one of the things that's also interesting is that sort of as you watch this guy use it, particularly at the end, it seemed less like he was using a tool and more like he was using an instrument, right? And especially, they even add those sort of chimes. As you, as you cross out more than one item at once, it sort of runs the scale talking with Phil Rue, who is the developer who made this, and that was by design. Like we wanted to sort of give this sense of playing an instrument. Because when you think about all of you guys with keyboards, or those of you who are musicians, you don't even think about that interaction. You're not doing that visual processing anymore. You're actually sort of going with intent, fluidly transformed to action, right? Without even sort of thinking about it. Talk about that in a little bit, that importance of muscle memory, which is a difficult thing to pull off on these glass screens where there's no feedback, right? But there's still sort of a thing of once you get used to gestures of uh, one, two, or three finger gestures. For example, Mac users use, use gestures on your trackpad. You know what I'm talking about? You use, wow, two or three fingers. You're, you're not thinking about it anymore, right? Yeah. It sort of just becomes part of how you use things. That's where we need to get all of us as a community and also uh, of users as well as of designers. <coughs> I want to give sort of one more example of, of ways that you sort of think differently about this stuff. Touch Up is, is another iPad app. And as its name suggests, oh, hi, Charlie. As its name suggests, <laughs> it's a way to touch up photos, right? And basically, you paint on filters, you know, using your finger as a brush. Very simplest example is just putting a color on, right? So if we do that here and we use, use the finger to sort of brush on, that's great. What if you want to change the brush size? Solved problem, right? Two ways to do it, really. You have a little slider, or maybe you, you, you have a button to bring up a palette and you choose your brush. The trouble is you've already got a brush, and it doesn't change size. So if somehow I change it so that the imprint that my finger makes on the screen doesn't match my finger size, uncertainty, right? I don't know what's going to happen when I touch the screen anymore. So touch up doesn't let you change the brush size. Instead, you change the canvas size by stretching it out and your finger remains the same on the screen. Super elegant and obvious when you see it, but turns on its head this convention that we're so used to as being the obvious, settled solution for the desktop. 
So throughout, there's just this thing of every time you encounter a problem, you're like, oh, I know how to solve that. I've done that for 20 years on the desktop. You gotta think, well, wait, is that really the way to do it for direct interaction? I'm doing a date range. Is it really two calendar pickers? Or can't I just stretch the date range? You know, what happens when you add physicality to your data objects? Think about if I could put this on a table as a flat thing, as malleable and stretchable, how would I manipulate that information, giving physicality to the data objects? At the same time, as, as I've been working with touch, which has been sort of the last five or six years, really since, uh, since the uh, iPhone came out in particular, I've also realized that sometimes the best touch interface is no touch at all. Because you know, it sort of sucks sometimes, right? When you're trying to tap stuff out and you know, autocorrect is screwing you up and it's just, sometimes these things are not great. Uh, and again, for those fine-tuned interactions, things like typing, that we get fouled up. Much better at these more coarse interactions, right? So one of the interesting things is to understand that touch is just one of an emerging set of interactions. It kind of got here first before the rest. If you look at what's happening now with the emergence of speech, Apple still calls Siri beta and it feels like it, right? You wouldn't want to run a nuclear power plant with Siri, I don't think. Uh, or Connect, you know, again, part of its, its charm, if you've if you played with Connect on an Xbox, is that it's inexact. It's not like you're snowboarding, but gone. You know, it's like part of the game is figuring out how to game the Connect. But you can see how good it's becoming. Things like facial recognition, camera vision, uh, all these ways that we interact as humans, touch, sound, speech, facial recognition, and natural gesture, the machines are beginning to understand. And now it's up to us as designers to figure out how do we put all those things together. And frankly, the combinations are especially exciting. We tend to think about things of, oh, this is a touch interface. Oh, this is a keyboard and mouse interface. This is a speech interface. The truth is, is that we're not going to have the luxury to keep thinking that way. That's what Windows 8 is trying to do, and that's why it's so hard. They're tackling this problem ahead of us, which is how do you create an interface, not only that can go out to any output, which is sort of a problem that anybody who's working on the web is sort of thinking about. It's like, oh, it's all the screen size headaches, but also any input. You know, Windows 8, designed to work with keyboard, mouse, touch, stylus, speech, natural gesture. Wow, hard problem. But it's these combinations, again, that are especially exciting. I think especially speech and gesture put together, which is going to be sort of necessary. You're going to have to talk to the device to let it know you're about to wave to it, or wave to it to let it know that you're about to talk to it. Guys, when you put speech and gesture together, you know what you get? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You get spells, you guys. That's what we're working with now. And, I, and, I, you know, and, I, and I mean that you really can create this sense of magic. This is my friend, Aral Balkan. He, he looks a little tired here because he's just been up all night at a hackathon. Aral always does things right, but he, he did a hackathon in Cannes on a boat, and you can see his wine glasses back here, so he's, he's doing all right. Uh, but he did this hack, and let me, let me show you what he came up with. So you're sitting at home on your sofa, watching television, as something interesting comes on, and you want to share it, say tweet. So um, I walk up to my TV, kind of wave at it so it knows I'm there. Um, and then when something interesting comes up, I can just grab it and boom. What? I put it over there. So I'm just holding it in my hand and I can bring it on my phone. That's my <laughs> Now I just want to point out, you did this overnight half drunk on wine, on boat, on the sea right? Using these consumer products that many of us already have in our house. He had bought an iPhone, a Kinect, yeah. a monitor, and a Mac. And so this stuff was just like, hey, overnight, got this. If you think about it, it's actually, while it seems incredibly magical what he did, it's sort of simple. He taught the Kinect this gesture, take a screenshot. One touch to the phone, move the screenshot over here. So he can do this thing where he's like, look, I've got it right here, right? So he's like, I've got the image right here. And he touched it. The interaction is actually super simple. The magic of it is combining gesture, touch, and speech, right? This stuff is, again, you know, this, this seems sort of sci-fi future. This stuff is all right now. I mean, one thing I want to show you here is Leap Motion, which is this little gadget that sits in front of a computer, set to release next month 
already in the hands of 12,000 developers. It's basically an incredibly sophisticated connect to a centimeter of sensitivity, as you see here. So it's going to detect fingertip motion or, or pencil motion. This is something that, again, you know, the device itself is going to be around 100 bucks. Uh, you put it in front of your computer, and boom, you're at this minority report, right? Uh, also, Asus, the, 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 one of the sort of the big uh, laptop makers, kind of commodity laptop makers, uh, has committed to putting these things into their laptops this year. This is the kind of stuff that's like, wow, this is shipping. You know, this is like real stuff that's like, we're going to have these things in here. You know, Microsoft is, is already experimenting with building Connect into displays and into laptops. So it's sort of this kind of gestural, again, supplement, not a replacement for using a keyboard and mouse, but a secondary combination, something that we're going to have to prepare for. And one of the exciting things is, is that this means that we don't actually interact with the screen itself necessarily. So again, sometimes the best touch interface is no touch. Remember the first time you guys saw Shazam? <laughs> right? <laughs> Whoa! It listened to the song and recognized the song. That's a great, that's a great touch screen app. It doesn't use the touch screen. Let me show you another example of something similar. Uh, Table Drum is an app that was uh, put together from some friends of mine in Sweden. It's uh, sort of, they call it augmented audio. We're thinking of augmented reality as something that's often sort of visual. In this case, it, it uses the microphone. It's a basic onboard sensor on every smartphone uh, to, to listen into the environment and create a whole new kind of experience. It is a drum machine app. Tons of these things in the app stores. These little things you pick out some drums and you sort of tap out a rhythm on the touch screen. You can do that with this. But the really interesting thing is the way that it uses the microphone to listen to you tapping on the table nearby. And then it, you've got the drum set. So logic is happening here, but it's really just a speaker as far as the interaction is concerned. Oh, doesn't know the glass sound. Let's teach it. So we choose this symbol put into training mode. All right, you ready? So what it's done though, it's so interesting, it's using the sensors, these basic onboard sensors that are in every one of your phones to move the interaction off of the screen and into the environment around me so I can have a much more sort of natural experience. We're starting to design not only for touch, but for sensors, right? And sensors that are, that come for free, and all these consumer devices that all of us have now. Things get even wackier when you start to think about actual sort of custom sensors and how your phone, your tablet, or other devices can interact with these custom sensors. Uh, here's one sort of literally Mickey Mouse example that the Walt Disney Research Group came out with late last year. They call it Botanicus Interacticus. <laughs> Botanicus Interacticus is a new interactive plant technology. Oh, yes. It requires no plant instrumentation. A simple electrode placed in the soil turns any plant into an expressive, multi-touch, gesture-sensitive controller. Plant you are, you guys. You know you've been waiting for it. <laughs> oh, yes! That feels good. A little more of that, please. That's good. <laughs> But so, you know, I have no idea what they're using this for. I think maybe the parks? Maybe? I don't know. They're going to do something in the parks? I don't know. But their point is like, wow, you can turn anything into a sensor. Anything now can be something that you use to interact because it's so trivially inexpensive to put a sensor and an internet connection on anything now. Which means that the physical world is getting more digital just as, you know, the digital world is getting more physical because of these things. It's so one last sort of wacky example, and then we'll get back to, to touch. In Switzerland, naturally, uh, farmers are, are trialing these cow sensors. So these things, while well, you put the sensor in the cow, <coughs> and it detects when the cow is in heat. Yeah. And then it texts the farmer. <laughs> Sending texts when you're in heat. I have friends who do this, too, right? <laughs> And of course, because it's Switzerland, the text can be in Italian or French or German. You guys, cow love knows no language boundaries, <laughs> at least in Switzerland. So if we get the Internet of Things, we've got the Internet of Cows now. We can get put sensors anywhere and talk to things, uh, the, the, the physical world, in, in ways that we haven't thought of that, so that the, the, the cows in this thing can actually act on our behalf. 
All right, so one of the interesting things about all this stuff is, wow, now we're getting really far afield from our traditional desktop graphic interfaces, right? Where again, we're so used to having things clearly labeled in buttons, but you know, this is a much more amorphous kind of thing. How do I know that I can gesture at my TV screen to take a screenshot and then touch my phone? These things aren't advertised. So what I want to do, just to sort of close out, is to talk about how do we teach this stuff? How do we make it more discoverable? First, you guys doing okay? <laughs> you look good. <laughs> yeah, you look good. All right, so that's, that's the challenge here, is how do you find out about these gestures? These unlabeled, invisible things, right? I mean, typically we rely on visual clues or past experience, which is why things like the pinch gesture for maps and for photos often has to be taught quickly, but then we get it, right? Because it feels physical. Uh, similarly, it'll work for the desktop, too, so that new users, for example, to iOS Maps app will quickly figure out that they can double tap on the map to zoom, not because they would ever do that to a physical map, because they would know it already from the desktop. Google Maps, double click, zooms in. What they will never figure out is that a two-finger single touch will zoom out. Has no correlation to anything, right? So for these abstract gestures, we need to help people understand them. But do understand that with a little bit of help, people will learn to work your interface sight unseeing, even if the gestures are, are invisible. So we do this all the time. If not using invisible interfaces, then at least, you know, interfaces that are in the dark. I don't know, does anybody still wake up to this sound? <laughs> one of these things? Usually one person will get a heart attack too by sort of playing the <laughs> alarm clock sound. All right. Whether you use your phone or you use other, that's not me, that's somebody else. <laughs> Whether you use your phone or one of these things, you know, it's like, wow, you can turn this off, forget about in the dark, in your sleep, right? Forget about invisible <laughs> controls, unconscious use of these things, right? You wake up two hours later and you realize you turned it off, on, you know, while you were asleep. Uh, so, you know, this is something that, again, sort of gets to this muscle memory thing that I was talking about, something you know so well, it becomes literally unconscious use. You know, and it sort of goes to, again, as I mentioned, sort of all of you with keyboards. It's a study that was done years ago in the 70s or 80s of professional typists, which I guess all of us are now, uh, asking them, you know, write down the order of the keys on the keyboard. Most of them couldn't do it. And these are people who could type, I don't know, 200 words a minute or whatever a lot of words a minute are. Uh, and yet they had no idea what, what was on the keys underneath their hands, right? Because they had gone from visual processing to this muscle memory. This thing just became instinctual, being able to use this stuff super rapidly. And that's where we need to be able to get people in terms of using at least basic gestures on these screens. The trouble with these examples, though, right, is that with the clock, we had to learn where the snooze button was before we could turn it off, right? With the keys, we needed to do hunt and peck before we could do that touch typing. It's so much faster. So nearly everything we know has to be taught or learned or observed. You can't just jump straight to it. So before we get to helping people find invisible gestures, I want to talk a little about, about the importance of visual cues. This is the OCD chef cutting board. So it's, you know, if you are someone who really wants your Alamed or Julienne cuts to be just so, right, this is what you use. You haven't, you haven't quite gotten it dead, so it's just muscle memory where you can just do it with your eyes cut. You need this, right? This is a cheat sheet, right? We have tons of these things in our lives. They could be your own personal system of reference or post-it notes that you surround around your, around your desk. Or it could be a more often systems that are imposed on us. Sort of social systems of reminders and cues that aren't in our own control either as consumers or as designers. Uh, great Don Norman in his book, Living with Complexity, talks about salt and pepper shakers. Uh, who thinks this one is salt? Nobody thinks it's salt? You got one salt? Pepper? Whoops. Pepper? Who has no idea? Yeah, all right. So Don makes the point that it doesn't matter which one is actually correct. All that matters is what the guy who filled them thinks. Right? <laughs> which is why when you go into a restaurant and you see this, you don't just dump it on, right? Because you know that not everybody gets it. You, know, you understand that this is a social convention that is not evenly understood, so you test it, right? Uncertainty. All UI conventions are social conventions. Some of them are better understood than others. Right now with gestures, we're in that 
we're, we're in that uneven state where we're getting emerging conventions, but that not everyone knows what they mean yet. What does a two-finger swipe mean? Well, it changes according to application because it's not fixed yet. So we're still trying to figure, out, figure this out. Typically, though, what we do to try to give confidence to, to people who use any interface is to you know, use labels. So you get something like this, which helps. If, you're, if, if your language, you know, pepper and salt starts with P and S, it's pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good start. You might be a little confused if this is upside down. You're like, I don't know what D is. <laughs> but you're getting there. But you know what's better than this? What well, this? Yeah. Right? Salt and pepper. You want it? Just you, you grab it. It's the content is the label here, right? Not any sort of visual processing. I understand it more instinctively. This is still a social convention. Because you'd be surprised if this was sugar. <laughs> but it's still something that's much clearer because you're letting now the content speak for it. Who needs a control? Who needs a label when you have the content itself? So one of the great things about touch interfaces is they really encourage and allow direct interaction with the content itself. You can do this, obviously, with, with mouse and keyboard things, too. But in this case, you're actually touching the thing. You're saying, I want that. And that sort of does something that triggers a little transistor in our head. So don't touch a button. Touch the content you want to work with. Uh, photo galleries are great about this. Really dense interface. And yet it's almost all content. Which photo do you want to see? This one? Here you go. Right? So this, this, one of the things that's exciting about this, about using content as a control and thinking about that as being your primary interface, is that you know, if you go back to what Marshall McLuhan said years ago, the medium is the message. Well, now we can be a place where the message can be the medium. The information can be the interface. Content can be the control. Use your own alliteration here if you want. It's so 23 letters to go still. So I think we may finally be getting to a place where we can do that. But that's something that, that, again, sort of helps to advertise, invite a touch, right? When sort of the content is front and center. What about, again, those more abstract actions? Well, a lot of times this is where we start, right? Instructions. So if you're going to use the popular science magazine app on iPad, this is where you have to start. Screens of every gesture that you can use to read the magazine. You know, and it's incredibly detailed. You know, New Yorker does something similar. All of these apps do, a lot of times these apps do this, where they tell you how to use every aspect of the application before you've even understood what it can do for, for you from a basic level. It's not just premature. It actually seem, makes it seem more complicated to use. I mean, all I want to do is read a magazine. How hard is it? Do I have to read all these instructions? <laughs> Koi Bin, who used to be the design director at New York Times Digital, uh, sort of poke some fun at this. It's like, you know, what if we did this for actual print magazines? This is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the pages stacked on the left side display your reading history. <laughs> and over here, pages on the right, that's your unread content. You guys, I don't know if you know about this save feature that magazines have. <laughs> but look, you guys, this is the most elegant interface that we've yet to come up with as human beings. And look how complicated it is when we do this to it. So this is something that I think is becoming a, a convention, unfortunately, for a lot of touchscreen apps. Let's overlay everything you can do. And I don't think that's helping people very well. Um, Norwegian TV, I bet you didn't see that coming, had this comedy sketch many years ago called the Medieval Help Desk. Uh, and what's going on here, we're going to come in in the middle, is that the book has just been invented. And scroll readers everywhere are in a panic. Right? <laughs> so this monk has called the Help Desk in for a little assistance. He thinks he's got it. I'll, I'll read, out, read this out loud to you because you can't see it in the back. He thinks he's got it, uh, and so he sends him on his way. He's like, oh, I get it now. It just takes a while when you're used to scrolls to get used to these books. All right, so everything's all right? Yeah, yeah, one last thing. You know what? Let's, let's run through it before you go. So I open it like this, and then uh, how'd you say? You turn the page. Oh, okay. Turn the page back and forth, and when I'm finished, I just close it. All right, great. See ya. Yep. All right, bye. But I can't believe it. It's like this again. I can't open it. I can't open it. Do you want it like the wrong side up? What do you mean the wrong side? We have to open it from the other side. Oh, so it matters which way you open it? Yeah, you have to open it from this side. Oh, I see. All right. Well, have you read the manual? The manual? Yeah, it comes with this guide for users. Here it is. 
<laughs> Same problem. Get over it. <laughs> so look, even if the guy could figure out how to open it and read it, you know he wouldn't read it. Because nobody reads it. All of us in this room, the tools we use every day, we have only incomplete expertise in it because we don't read the fucking manual. Right? <laughs> We complain about it for our users. Oh, I read these instructions, but none of us do it. You know why? Because it seems like it's a diversion from what we're trying to get done—to get work done, or to play a game, or whatever it is we're doing. We just want to get right to it. That's why Monopoly is such a miserable, long game. Because none of us read the instructions. We make up our own rules. We can't even <laughs> free parking. It lasts forever. If you read the instructions and you play by the rules, it's really fast. It's still like a really mean-spirited, awful game, but it ends quickly, at least, right? So nobody reads the manual, nobody reads the instructions. So since we can't get people to read, we're like, well, people like to watch TV, right? So let's maybe watch, make them watch a screencast, maybe with this guy. <laughs> so Al Gore uh, wrote a book called Our Choice. It was adapted into a really wonderful ebook. Lots of great thoughtful interactions by a company called Push Pop Press, which was bought by Facebook, so we'll never hear from them again. But uh, most of it really self-explanatory. But Al took no chances. So when you launch the app, you have to watch this video. People say Al Gore is a little wooden. I personally don't get it. You decide. This app is a new kind of book <laughs> that combines text and images, as well as video, interactive infographics, interactive infographics. and audio commentary, all to help bring this important message to life. You can browse through the different chapters by swiping through the visual table of contents, or Browse through a chapter by scrolling through the pages at the bottom. To start reading, use two fingers to pop a page open. To go back to the table of contents, just pinch the page down. You'll find images, movies, and interactive infographics. Interactive infographics. Pages throughout the <laughs> you can pick anything up using two fingers and pop it open. Tap the globe in the corner to see a photo's location on an interactive map. Interactive. <laughs> and she returned to the page you were reading. Movies work the same way. Most modern wind turbines consist of Some images unfold to reveal the other half. Some photos have audio commentary. Industrial agriculture now uses 10 kilns of energy. A hand icon marks our choices interactive infographics. Interactive infographics. <laughs> Use your finger to explore the data. I hope that you will enjoy this new reading experience. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Al, because you really sucked the joy out of the first two minutes. Of <laughs> but wow, what great interactions, right? Really direct interactions right on the content itself. Very few sort of traditional buttons or controls. Most of it's really pretty obvious. A few tricky things, right? I don't know, folding out the pictures with two fingers. You know, so even the most elegant interfaces at, at some of the edges are going to need some help, some instruction. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to do it with a manual or with a video of the guy who invented the internet to be able to do it. Right? <laughs> I think it's worth sort of pointing out first though that nature itself doesn't have instruction. That doesn't mean that nature is an easy interface. I mean, all of us in this room spent the first two or three years of our life as complete morons, covered <laughs> in bruises and scratches, trying to figure out this really difficult interface uh, and but being surprised by it constantly. But over time, we sort of get better at it. You guys look like you're doing pretty well with this interface that we call nature, which means that all of us, as well as all of our users and all of our customers, have this incredible base of knowledge and experience to draw on for how the physical world works that we can then apply to our, these, these digital interfaces that have the illusion of physicality. Um, you know, Apple emphasizes this a lot in its human interface guidelines. Make it realistic, you know, so-called skeuomorphism, which is something that, that has become somewhat uh, aesthetically, I would say, controversial uh, in the design community. Make it look like a regular device, and then people will understand how to use it, and you'll also get this emotional connotation that comes from it. Whatever you think of it as an aesthetic approach, it's a sound teaching approach, right? And so 
the problem is that it's more than just sort of making it look pretty, making it look like a real object. And Apple's own applications sort of show some of the, the, the difficulty with this. Calendar app for iPad, lovely date book. And one of the great things about the design is because it's this paged book, you know how to use it, right? You can just sort of swipe to turn the page. Oh, sorry, you guys, hang on a second. It's, uh, Huh, now for the first 18 months of the app, nothing happened. It took them 18 <laughs> months to fix this. You see this little tiny little button right here? Yeah. That's how you turn the page, this desktop style interaction. You guys, the, the, you know, so you have to hit that to make it go. Your interface is, you know, gives people hints about how to use it. And this was a lie, right? This was misdirection. Actually, much worse for the contacts app, which, this, which remains this way to this time. But if you go to turn this page, Start deleting data. <laughs> yes. Wow. You know, your interface metaphor, again, suggests how you use the app. This is dangerous misdirection. If you're going to go this way, you've got to embrace that metaphor. If you can't make it act like the thing, don't try to make it look like the thing. You know, it's got to, if it looks like a book, make it act like a book. Otherwise, you know, you're, don't make me sort of hit these buttons. On the other hand, you've got things like magazine apps. That are basically just sort of glorified PDFs. So very true to the original experience. This linear swipe, swipe, swipe thing. A lot of times a table of contents is hard to find in these things, right? So you're almost reduced to this really linear swiping experience. Easy to use, except that it takes away the great advantage of the digital medium, which is random access to content. Well, I want to go straight to this thing that interests me. Uh, so they're, they're, if you embrace these kind of realistic interfaces, if you go that route, don't forget to enable what digital media can do best, which is to unshackle us from these linear reading experiences. So an interesting example of a way to get around this is from the, the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper app. Works like you'd expect. You can sort of browse it like a newspaper, sort of very familiar physical experience. And this, these, these uh, uh, page indicators show your progress through there. But something a little unusual is that you can actually touch those page indicators to show all the headlines on the page. And as you sort of swipe across, you can quickly scan everything in the entire edition and then jump straight to that issue. So it sort of has the best of both worlds in a way. So lots of great opportunities, especially with tablets like this, which suggest things of the desktop, of phones, of physical experiences, of, of the traditional software and of the web. The trick is that we can't mix the metaphors of all of those things. We have to be very sort of cautious about how we do it. And in fact, I would say that we need to model our interfaces to help people learn the same way that they learn in the real world. You know, right from our earliest days, we rely on physical hints about how something works, and then verify it through the feedback that the thing gives to us. You, know, you watch how toddlers use an iPad. You guys have seen toddlers use an iPad, right? At least on YouTube. I mean, cats are using iPads on YouTube. <laughs> cats and toddlers are figuring out how to use this thing. Your customers can too. In fact, I would say, you know, it's amazing how quickly toddlers can figure this out, zipping and swiping and pinching through, through these interfaces, because they're using it the way that they've come to understand the physical world. And oddly, right, sort of start to understand the physical world the way they learn it on the digital world. They might not get your multi-level menu navigation, but neither will your adult users, so that's OK. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you they, they will get any physical metaphor. So it's really worth asking. Would my five-year-old niece understand how to use this control? Not necessarily what the app is for, but the control itself. They figure this out. I'm serious about this. Get a four-year-old or a five-year-old and make her your beta tester, because they're better at this than we are. Because they haven't been poisoned by 30 years of desktop <laughs> interface interactions. And they're thinking about it from a pure and naive point of view. So follow the toddlers. They're better at this. Along those lines, I'm going to sort of wrap this up here, which is a couple of things here. First, this is your homework. To play more video games. Game designers are at the lead, as far as I'm concerned, of all interaction design for teaching an interface. In many games, you, know, you don't even know what your object is when you start, let alone what your capabilities are, or what your obstacles are going to be. And the way you find out is not to read a manual or to watch a video. The game shows you, draws you through, gives you cues, gives you challenges, <laughs> shows you new information at the moments that you need it. So look quickly at the way they do it, and I'll wrap this up and we can go to some questions. Among other things, games use these three techniques.
to teach an interface. Coaching, leveling up, and power-ups. Every modern theory of learning emphasizes the importance of active participation, active discovery, supplemented by coaching and mentoring. So let's start there with coaching. Simple demonstrations, right? Prompts to tell you what to do. This is the game riding along with the player, the application or the website riding along with the user. We learn by doing, right? We learn best in the moment. Telling people how to do something, not nearly as effective as coaching them through it, especially, again, when we're thinking about these physical interactions. Teaching an instrument, a tennis serve, how to throw a football, all these things, right, these physical actions, not something you can read about, something someone has to show you, and then you practice, 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 demonstration and practice. Uh, so that's what you see in a lot of games. This is a, an iPad game called uh, Dead Space, very first screen of the game, teaching you how to move. It's a little text that explains it. You probably don't even need that. Here's this overlay, and it just waits. Nothing's going to happen. It's all right. Nobody's going to come in and blast you away, whatever happens in games like this. Instead, it just waits. And once you do it, and you move the guy around, the overlay goes away. You did it. Your first interaction was a success. And now, by the way, I don't need to coach you anymore. So many times in applications, we keep coaching people after they've already learned it. Pay attention. Add a learning layer to your application. And sort of see where people have gone so that you can give them appropriate information. So these simple temporary overlays, we call them coach marks often on the web or other things. So here in Google Drive, showing you about a new feature. A lot of websites do this. Yours can too. <laughs> Some of you might be squirming a little bit, because this might seem a little bit, I don't know, like a certain interface flop. <laughs> a flop name for Clippy. Now, Clippy was never helpful, right? Always a distraction. <laughs> Pop up at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the problem wasn't so much the clippy concept as the execution, right? And especially the inane content. You know, only offered to do the dopiest things. You want to write a letter? Yeah, I don't want to write a letter. <laughs> you know? Done right, though, this assistant feature, like you see in Gmail or Facebook or in so many games, can be really helpful to give information at, at appropriate times. It can be subtle and respectful, and often just a little tweak, a little uh, animation can help. This is the USA Today app from right after the App Store opened back in 2008. And they had this net thing where you could navigate the sections of the newspaper. And it was this dial. You know, this, is a, this was a convention that Facebook used at the time to navigate. They found that people didn't see it or, or didn't recognize that it was interactive. And they thought sections were missing. So they added this little thing where every time you visited this front page, it would zip in from the right. It moves. Maybe I can move it too instantly got much better pick up on it. The thing is, that can be really annoying if it keeps happening every time you visit your favorite news app, right? And so basically they would say, and this is one of the great things about the phone, there's only one user on it, basically, for the most part. Uh, once you've used it yourself, great, don't show the animation anymore. The user's figured it out. Right? So just pay attention to what the person has used and done and sort of change your, your interface appropriately. You've got to provide visual cues for these hidden things. You can't just count on people to find them. The next little bit about this is, is leveling up. Uh, an important component of coaching is that you don't teach everything all at once. You know, we learn best by getting it in doses. Uh, so you ease players into a game, you, use, you ease your users into an application, introducing one element at a time, encouraging people to master that before you teach them the next thing. Now that you block access to more advanced features, so you don't necessarily overwhelm them with education about them all at once. Learn it all a little bit at a time. We're most motivated to learn a new skill at the moment that we discover that we need it, right? Like, I don't know, when you're about to get your butt kicked by a guy with a giant sword, right? So this is Infinity Blade, uh, another iPad game. Incredibly complex battle system, but they make it easy by breaking it down and teaching you one step at a time. And they do it by freezing the action right here at incredibly convenient moments and say, I don't know, you want to learn to block? Yeah, I really am motivated. <laughs> Shows you, you do it, and again, your first interaction is success. Do it over and over again. Want to know how to dodge? Yes, I do. You know? And so it's, it stops the action, shows you how to do it, and makes you do it. Right? Demonstration and practice. 
OS X did this, by the way, when they first uh, introduced, I don't know if you guys remember this, an OS X Lion. They changed the way that you scroll to turn gravity upside down. You had to swipe or move your mouse in a whole different direction to, to move. Big deal. So when you did the installation, they told you that that had just happened. And they said, here, scroll in this little window. And that's how you got to the continue button. Make you do it, demonstrate, and practice, right? That's it. All right, so the last thing I'll show, and then, and then I'll shut up and, and let you guys ask some, some questions if you like, is power-ups. And power-ups are, are sort of like the, the, sh the, the, the keyboard shortcuts of video games, the same way that, that gestures are the keyboard shortcuts of touch. <coughs> you think about the concept about evolving from beginner to expert. You know, expertise is where the, the fancy moves come in, the, the power-ups. So, you know, in video games, like you have, this, you have the Super Mushrooms and Super Mario Brothers, they give you some kind of superpower. They turbo boost your game, giving you a shortcut or some other advantage. But it's also a reward, right? It's an achievement. It's a marker. There's a thrill to that. A lot of loose talk about gamification of here's some lousy badge for going to the dry cleaner more than anyone else in your neighborhood. <laughs> it has empty meaning, right? What's the real thrill of a game? Getting better at it. Wow, I'm good at this. Right? And if you think about that, this isn't just for games, this is in our own work. Say, you know, whatever, you use Visio or Illustrator or something like that every day. Somebody comes over and looks over your shoulder, are you doing it that way? Did you know about this? <laughs> right? The satisfaction of learning something new, of sort of going to the next level of mastery, that's something that your application can do. And that you can also use that as teaching moments to deliver that. So, last example. Twitter, about a year ago, changed their iPhone and Android app completely and push some really popular features down a level. So direct messages and account switching used to be available from anywhere in the app, but then they put them here in the Me tab. They knew that that would upset some users who really use those features a lot, so they added some gestures to make it easy to get to those. So if starting at this Me tab where these things are located, you can swipe this way to get to account switching, swipe it back, get to direct messages up here, like that. Not advertised anywhere. No instructions. You've got to find it yourself by accident or have somebody tell you about it. An Easter egg. Right? This could have been a power-up moment. There's, there's utility in having people do it, learn the slow way. Reinforces the mental model of where this stuff lives in the application. Direct messages, account switching, they're under the me tab. But after the tenth time that you hit that direct messages thing, this is what I wish they did. Show you how to do it and then make you do it. Demonstration and practice. Right? Observe how people are using the application, and when they get to a little level, give them a power-up. This is, this is combining coaching, leveling up, and power-up all in once, and there's a satisfaction. Who uses the Twitter app here? Who knew about this? Who's psyched to know about it? <laughs> right. <laughs> power-up, there you go. The fact that we need to do this, though, shows that we're still in the salt and pepper stage of developing these gesture conventions, which means, you guys, it's really important to be generous generous with our users and explaining how you use this stuff, but also with, with each other. What's working for you guys? How can we as a community arrive at standards that actually make sense? So having meetups like this where we can talk about it is important, but also reaching out to your fellow developers and designers. Hey, you, I see you did this interesting thing. How's that working out? We need to talk about this stuff. One of the really exciting things about this is that we are part of creating this new way of working with information. This doesn't come along a lot. It doesn't come off along very often. Centuries at a time go before we have new ways to manipulate or share information. And you guys, we're in the middle of it. The most exciting times in the history of technology, possibly in the history of culture. So you guys, embrace that. Go out and make something amazing for serious. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Is it because it takes so much more time, really? Because, I mean, that's that much more time in development. I think, I think that there is that effort, and we don't yet have frameworks for doing this. Games do, right? Games have these, sort of these engines and these frameworks built in that you can kind of do some of these things. And partly, you know, a lot of it is, frankly, that as always, education tends to fall apart. Let's build the thing first, and then we can tell people how to use it. And I think in general, you see this pattern over and over again, that in the first years of any new technology, we're just trying to figure out how to make it work. You know, and then the polish comes in. Then we can sort of figure out how to, how to do things. Um, and I think that, that here we're, we're very much seeing that. But you know, I, I think seriously, uh, you know, I'm not a huge gamer myself, but I benefit so much every time I do play games, because I'm like, wow, right. Every enterprise piece of software, financial management application should do what this game is doing, because it makes it more pleasurable, easier to figure out how to use. Contextual education. Yes? I know in the web world there's something called WPC that establishes standards for the web. Yeah. Is there anything like that? Do you see any value in something like that? For the uh, you know, the question is that you know, we have the W3C and other standards bodies. All, many industries have standards bodies, right, to sort of say this is how things should work. Uh, and the question is, do we have anything like that for, for gestures and for interfaces like this? You know, we don't really. Um, and in one case, I'm not sure that it, I think we will eventually need some stuff like that, at least to sort of suggest some broad patterns from some sort of central kind of thing that, that we can all use as a resource. The trouble with standards bodies is that they aren't great at innovating. You know, so standards bodies are, are great at saying, innovation has happened and we believe this is the way to do it. It's not always the best way that, that they choose, but that's, that's typically it. So standards bodies and generally broad communities often aren't where the innovation happens. And for better or worse, it's often in private playgrounds. So you see a lot of innovation in this stuff happening right now with players like Apple, for example. Some of the early stuff I was saying about how devices interacting with each other and some of the, the far out stuff that's already arriving now, you're seeing that stuff happen in private playgrounds because that's typically where innovation happens before it can become sort of standardized. There are risks to that. You know, we were sort of talking about this before. There are uh, intellectual property risks if, you know, that companies are very patent happy these days. And, a, and there's a real danger to companies patenting gestures, like Twitter has, has, has patented the pull down to refresh gesture, or, or, typically, or actually the pull down and let go gesture. So Apple, when they introduced that into their mail app, just did pull down, to sort of sidestep that patent. You know, this is dangerous when we're sort of trying to figure out what's the way that all of us will communicate with machines and touch screens now. The idea that they, can be, that they will be patented or owned by one company, potentially litigated, is um, not a good thing. I'm not a huge fan of the patent system when it comes to software and interface design in general. What else? Uh, do you have any thoughts about those of us who work in playing on enterprise level, giant financial firms, so you know, working against product owners and scrub masters, and you know, yeah. you know how to, um, you know, like, I, I do a lot of advocating for the user, but that gets, that gets buried in <laughs> agile and, and, you know, 14 sprints later. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't say that any of this is an enemy of agile process particularly, right? This is more, uh, um, priorities of the organization. And unfortunately, there's some notion for, for the people who fund and create enterprise software and software that's supposed to be used by their employees, the people who are supposed to be taking care of and are taking care of them, to sort of say, you know what, you don't need a good user experience. Uh, this, is, this can be a miserable user experience. And I, I don't think that that makes good sense, but I think that one of the exciting things right now is that through the history of computing, it's always been enterprise pushing out into the consumer world. So we had these business machines, you know, from IBM in the early days, pushing out from the, the corporate world into the consumer market. And now we're seeing the reverse, where the consumer market is now entering the enterprise, where it's, it's our experiences with phones that we're bringing out our phones into the office uh, and, and our tablets. And so I think that we have an opportunity to start to see some typically consumer experiences start to hit enterprise software too. Uh, as that becomes an expectation. So I think that there is a place, and ought to be a place, in enterprise software for this stuff, because everybody deserves a great user experience. And I think that when it comes to touch screens, that these kinds of gestures are more efficient, easier, and frankly, just are more pleasurable and, and, and intuitive to use. 
And so it does take, the, the thing is, is that we're at this period where we have to think about this stuff a lot more. It's hard to get, you know, big screen interfaces into the small screen. We have to think about them differently. We have to think about the inter interactions for touch. And, you know, naturally internal projects often don't get the financial or, or schedule love that, that they probably deserve. So keep fighting the good fight is all I, is all I can suggest. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what kind of approach uh, you should take with, you know, sort of the multicultural world, a lot of gesturing and these different things, and you know, you're yeah, right. salt and pepper, and your language salt and here's the best. You're right. Don't do okay in some in some places. Yeah, yeah that's right. So what sort of like mindset or approach do you think would be best in like we have this gesture but it has to expand the world? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, you know, I think that for a lot of this stuff, because it's such basic physical interaction of sort of like how would you manipulate this, that it has less of the cultural overtones that, that maybe you're talking about. And right now, I'm, I'm really sort of saying, wow, you know, what does a full finger, full hand press do? What are these sort of shortcuts? I'm not sure that at least for some of the basic building block work that we need to do, some of the cultural uh, risks that you're talking about are, are um, really at the forefront. But I think that some of the, you know, before some of this more physical metaphor came in, and we were looking at touch screens, particularly as stylus experiences, there was much more of sort of drawing figures and letters and things like that to sort of um, make something happen. And now that we've moved to much more of a physical interface rather than sort of a semantic interface, I think that a lot of those problems go by the wayside. I'm not as concerned about those. Yeah. I think it's important to, to point out too is, is that you know sometimes you need to be able to turn off these gestures as well because you might do that something habitually that that you know by the blows time the, the thing whole up. screen yeah. just move out yeah. of the way yeah. and now I gotta get back to it and how do you turn this feature off yeah. like that is I mean yes we, we need to think of creative ways but some people may tap their you know their computer a lot with their five fingers and be opening up things yeah yeah. And, uh, and so the, the question is, you know, how, how do you, if we're doing everything with touch, you know, sometimes we're going to like blow the thing up by touching, you know, how can we sort of turn it off or make it less sensitive to this so that it, it, to, you know, we don't run into that. If something happens with this actually with, with Apple, I guess iOS 5, I think, they introduced some gestures to be able to work at the operating system level. You know, so a four or five finger swipe moves you among applications where you can sort of three or four finger swipe down to get to your, uh, you know, the last applications. The trouble is, is that they did this in the canvas itself, taking these great gestures, four or five finger touch gestures, and using them for the operating system. Um, when you look at a lot of other touch-based operating systems, including Web, Windows 8, WebOS, BlackBerry, they use the edges, they use the frame. So you sort of have to drag from the frame to sort of trigger these operating system things, which is interesting because it's sort of like, oh, it leaves the main canvas for the application but also it uses the metaphor of the frame of the device itself that matches this sort of metaphorical frame of the operating system uh, uh, for, the, for the application. Um, so I think that there are sort of some things in terms of this, of, of how we think about competition with applications and operating systems that we have to be careful about. I think you're also right that there are sort of things that that's something we need to make it easy to be sort of like, I actually don't want you to be so sensitive right now. People say that to me all the time. <laughs> uh, but, but also that's the opportunity of, I think, combining some of these inputs, right? You know, that you can sort of give it a touch and then tell it to do something and then sort of, you know, then it's... So I think that there's some things that as we start to combine inputs and start designing for sensors as well as for touch, that there are some opportunities there. I feel like there's somebody, yeah, in the back. Okay. From the perspective of a powered up user, can you ever envision something like a piano being improved on with instead of a physical instrument using it, can, can touch ever improve that paradigm of something like that? Well, it's interesting, right? So the question is, you know, we've got these great physical objects that are do, sort of doing all this stuff. Can something as sort of, you know, weak in a sense as a glass screen that looks like a piano ever replace that? And, you know, and I think that, that we... We're always in a rush, right, to sort of improve on the physical with the digital. And you know, I think that a lot of us who are book lovers, you know, regret that even as we start reading our Kindles. You know, we're sort of like, oh, this is what a shame that this is happening to the book. And we're like, mm. 
we do lose something, right? And, and I mean, it's something that the resonance and the experience of playing a physical instrument like a, like a piano or a guitar or something can't ever be the same as using a, a, a digital device. So there are some things that are matters of convenience. But it's like, well, at least we don't have to carry all those books around with us. We've got this sort of very light convenience that many of us are saying, well, that's, that's an acceptable alternative. And you know, for some musicians, the ability to sort of be able to compose on something without actually carrying a piano around is a convenience, but I doubt that most of those musicians would prefer to replace the piano entirely with it. So I think that what I'm suggesting is not that the digital should replace the physical, but really that the physical should inform the way that we design digital interfaces. So at the same time, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the digital world is becoming more physical by the fact that we can actually carry these interfaces around with us and manipulate them with sort of faux physicality. The physical world is also becoming more digital. So what's interesting is, well, what happens when I can talk to that physical piano from any device? You know, that there, there becomes manipulation with that physical world. What are the opportunities there where we can have real player pianos worth at a distance, for example? Just sort of riffing here. Yeah. So much of what we're talking about is in the realm of native apps. Yeah. And so much of what probably many of us still do is in the realm of the browser. Right? Yeah. Where do you see the browser? Do you see it evolving to uh, encompass more of the capabilities, or do you think that uh, that there's really a paradigm shift? Yeah. So the, the question is, well, isn't all this stuff sort of the domain of, of native applications? What about the web? You know, where does the web sit with all of this? The web is going to be crucially important, no matter what, to knit all these things together. There's a lot of um, controversy often. Is that do we do native apps or do we do web apps? How do we do this? Important considerations for the folks who build these things have to pay for them, maintain them. Users don't care. You know, as long as the thing works, the really important thing is that all these things are converging in the cloud now, right? So the web is going to remain central first. But in terms of the interface question that you're getting at, um, the device APIs will come to the browser. You know, I mean, that, that will happen. And I would say a little bit shame on the browser makers for not making it happen faster. Because you do see some technologies uh, like PhoneGap, which are sort of like that, essentially let you build your own custom browser with all the features that the browser should have had in the first place. It will happen. Um, there are some issues to get at, you know, which is just sort of like things like, well, should the browser have access to your contacts the way that, you know, the way that native apps can? You know, what does it mean that the web browser can easily get at the camera? But many Android apps can get at the cam. Many Android browsers can get at the camera now to record photo and video. So you can create a camera app in the web now for many Android things. So this is happening. The other thing that I would point out, though, is that you can be a web partisan without necessarily being a browser partisan. And we're seeing the web start to infuse all kinds of places, showing up embedded in, um, in e-books, showing up embedded in native apps, that Windows 8 itself, you can write entirely native applications using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, compiles the JavaScript right down to native code. Uh, and so the, the point is, is that web technologies are going everywhere and that it's really more about the web going into applications more than applications going into the web. And so you know, I think that, that the web and, and, and web technologies are going to be as strong as ever. But I think that the idea that as soon as we can sort of release ourselves from thinking that everything has to happen in a browser gives the web so much more power. And I think it will have access to all these different sensors and abilities. But right now, web technologies are really crummy about sort of dealing with touch. Really bad touch support, really primitive touch support. Uh, and it's really difficult to code gestures that aren't a touch or a swipe. I mean, which is good, let's, let's start there. But you know, doing something like, oh, good luck with that three finger twist, you know, it's really difficult to program. So it's got to improve. But we're seeing things like in Windows 8 where they added a bunch of custom JavaScript to get at things like a rotate or a pinch that you can have those sort of DOM level access to say, oh, is there a pinch on this element? In the same way that we have a tap or a click on something, that will come too. So the web is lagging native apps. And again, you see this innovation happens often in proprietary systems before it goes to sort of more general standard systems. And the web is always a story of that, where we're always waiting, right? And it, and it happens eventually. Look, look at HTML5, finally. Yeah. <laughs> How are we doing? More? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, talk, you were talking about how uh, someone asked a question about pianos. You were about becoming or moving to a virtual interface or a touch gesture interface. I recently saw a product, or yeah, it was a product. It was screen technology that injected sort of like a gel into the screen that raised part of the screen. Yeah. So it 
So it's sort of some haptic feedback yeah. in the screen itself, yeah. Right, squishy screens. There you go. No, I mean, and I think that's right. I mean, one of the things that makes it difficult to use an iPad, for example, for typing is you don't get anything back, right? And so they are, as you say, working on some of these things, these sort of things that can raise letters, things that can give you some, some, some physical cues that will make this stuff easier to use. And, um, you know, but I think also, you know, sort of go back to also some of these ideas of where we can put sensors in just about anything. And we're able to manipulate or get information from the world itself where we may not even need to manipulate a screen directly anymore. Um, talk to a lot of medical device manufacturers where they're really doing some interesting things. Medical device manufacturers are great at creating sensors, terrible at, at creating user interfaces, right? So they've got like, and they have to build these computers to sort of like run or make sense of the sensors. But what's really interesting is like now they're sort of like, well, wait a second. Everybody's got a great computer with a great user interface in their pocket now. What if we just create a sensor that can talk to these things? So for example, you're seeing really amazing stuff. There's this company called Proteus. It's basically made a pill that, tells when it, that can tell you when it's been taken. So it's basically this little sensor that's about the size of a grain of sand, has the same stuff that it would have in a, in a vitamin, magnesium, copper, is when it hits your stomach acid, it turns into a battery, strong enough to send out a little signal that you know people who are taking this have wear this little patch that has a Bluetooth transmitter, relays the signal here to your tablet, and boom, to your doctor. Wow, right? <laughs> Other things, you know, there's a, a, um, a medical device manufacturer I was talking to that has come up with this uh, sensor to help people who have very advanced pulmonary illness, really sick hearts. And in this case, um, you know, it, People aren't doing well at all anyway, but you can tell when they're about to have a turn for the worse by a change in their blood pressure. So this little sensor is something that goes into the body, embedded into an artery near the heart, and the trouble is, you know, it detects the blood pressure thing, but how do you, how do you get the information from it? It's in your body, right? You know, how do you do it? You touch your skin, you just touch a, a tablet, and it downloads the information through your skin. Tricorder stuff, right? I mean, it's just like where it's just like we're getting to this thing now where, you know, I don't have to type or tap or say anything into this thing. It just knows from my body what's happening. Some of this can get a little creepy, right? <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a, but this is the, the nature of where we are now. This is not coming down the road. This is not this will be possible five years from now. This is inexpensive and happening now. And a lot of this stuff is happening with the sensors that you guys already have in the, the phones you're carrying in your pocket. You know, this is like basic consumer technology now. And so I would say that the user interface field just hasn't quite caught up with it yet. Of what can we do with all this stuff? It's just now available. You know, when you see sort of things that toys and games lead the way in experimenting with this stuff. Things like that drum app, right? It's a little toy, but wow, wait a second. This is like figured out how to move the interaction off of the screen just using the microphone to the table around them. That's the stuff that I think is really exciting sort of where I'm turning my attention to uh, now, that sort of more basic mobile practice is, is sort of becoming absorbed into, uh, into companies, into regular practice. You know, my sort of thinking as somebody who tries to help people look ahead is that's it, because that's what we're going to be all dealing with in the next five years. Is a new book in the works? Oh, in theory, a new book is in the works. Yeah, my editor thinks a new book is in the works. <laughs> <laughs> working on it, yeah, working on it. OK, thank you very much. Great. Uh, so we'll see everyone, we hope, in a couple of weeks. I guess it's a month uh, for number three. Thank you very much for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you.